All right, hello and welcome to the last Linux Days event. I'm Aline and I'm going to teach you about tile and window managers today. But first, let's get to know each other. Who of you has been at another Linux Days event this year? <laughs> All right, quite a few. And who has installed Linux this semester? One, two, okay. Well, <laughs> All right, then let's get started. Now, uh, since I have no idea where you are coming from, from what studying fields, uh, you know, I'm from a computer science background, and some of the concepts that I'm going to explain today are like second nature to me, but they might not be to you. So if I tell you something that you don't understand, I want you to interrupt me, right? I want you to shout at me because I am not going to see the right hands. I'm inattentive like that. I want you to interrupt me and ask your questions as you go because otherwise you're going to be confused for the half of the course and you're not going to know where I am. Then. Can you promise me that? Perfect. Well then, let's get started. Today, you're going to learn what a window manager is, what it does, uh, what a tiling window manager in particular reason does, and why tiling is so awesome. Because I really like tiling, I think this is the best thing ever, and I'm going to tell you why I think that. Then I will explain the concepts behind tiling window management, how does it work internally, what's different, what kind of uh, approaches are there, and I will also briefly explain how you can install it on your own system. And uh, the most important part is, of course, a live demo. I have picked a few chosen tiling window managers that I'm going to demonstrate to you today so that you can afterwards easily choose which one you like best and which one you should install on your own system if you want to do that. So let's get started. Uh, what's a window manager? Well, obviously, it's a part of your system that manages your windows. That means your window manager decides... Uh, where your windows go and how large they're supposed to be and what happens if you drag them around and how they overlap each other and then which workspace they show up and if, on which they don't, all this stuff. And you already have one on your system. Uh, obviously, I'm going to assume every one of you has a desktop environment installed and your desktop environment also manages windows. The window manager is a part of your desktop environment. It's a separate program, so to say, but it's included. And what you have is a stacking window manager. A stacking window manager, that's what you're all used to. You have windows that are coming yeah, in, in these boxes that you can move around and resize and full screen and you, they can overlap each other. And yeah, that's that. You're used to that. You know how it works, right? And now how is tiling different? In a tiling window manager, you cannot arrange the windows yourself with your mouse. The windows are arranged for you. And you, they are arranged in a way that you always see all of them entirely. They do not overlap each other. They're always right next to each other or maybe in a grid. And they always take up the entire screen. There's no wasted space. You don't see your desktop wallpaper at any point in time, except when you have nothing open, of course. And now you might wonder, how is this better? Why is this so cool? What's the deal with that? Now, let me ask you one question. Who of you has ever had any benefit from arranging windows like this? Who has ever done some productive work with windows arranged like that? Nobody. Right, I haven't either. This is, this is garbage. You know, the browser window is kind of yeah, unusable because it's so much in the background, you don't really see it, you can't use it. You have to first bring it to the foreground if you want to use the browser. And because of that, the entire space that the browser window takes up is kind of wasted. It's useless. And also the space that you see, the, the wallpaper in the background, it's wasted space. It's not used for anything. And the only thing that you can really use in these screenshots are the terminal and the file manager. And look at how much space of the screen they actually take up. It's basically nothing. All the rest of the space is wasted. So what you usually do, this screenshot is from my own system. It's XFC. I've used XFC for quite a while myself. And usually I work like this. You know, you can take your window and grab, uh, move it to the border of your screen and then it will be maximized over half the screen. And this is awesome because now you, if, you, if you have to work in two windows at the same time, you can move them like next to each other. There's no wasted space. They uh, take up the entire screen and you can work with both of them because none of them are covered up. Or what I also commonly do is just full screen everything because when I'm browsing, I don't need any other windows. And then why would I have my browser in a small, tiny window that I can move around? I would just full screen it and then I can focus on browsing. Nothing else is distracting me. I get all the space that my screen has to offer. Why would I want anything else, right? And now, 
you probably already do this because all modern desktop environments on the window manager stay include have this feature where you can drag a window in a corner and then ex expands over half the screen. And I'm going to assume that most of you do this. So why would you do it by hand? Why would you bring up the effort of actually having to drag your window to the border of the screen or press a separate key combination in order to have it take up half of the screen if your window manager can actually do this for you? That's what tiling window management is. It does that, right? I just showed you in this screenshot with the two windows open full screen, and it does it automatically for you. You don't have to press any additional key combinations. And now there's one remaining question. How does the tiling window manager know where to place the windows? How does it know if a new window opens where to put it? Does it put it in the bottom half or in the right half or in the right lower quarter of the screen? How does it know? And there are several different approaches and two fundamentally different concepts in tiling windows are based on lists or trees. And I'm going to explain to you what this means in a second. First, let's look at list-based tiling. List-based means that all the windows that are currently open on your desktop are in an ordered list. You have the first window, second window, third window, and so on. They all have a specific number. And that number determines where they go on your screen. There are numerous ways of doing this, and I'm going to show you some examples now. This is the most common approach to list-based window management. It's called stack mode, sometimes master stack mode, or just master mode. One window manager also calls it tall mode. You see, those names are not standardized at all. Every window manager uses different names for these things, but they're all the same concept. So I'm going to call it master mode or stack mode today. And in master mode, stack mode, you have one window that's the most important window, usually the first window in the list, and that takes up half of the screen. And all the other windows take up the rest. So you see here the first window takes up half the screen, and two, three, and four are stacked on top of each other. That's why it's called stack mode, because the windows are stacked on top of each other. And if you would open another window, it would pop up below the four window, and then you would have four windows on top of each other. And there are variations of this master stack layout. One is called n stack, or actually n master makes more sense in this context, because here you don't not only have one window that's the most important, but here in this example we have two. So these two windows are in the left half of the screen, and all the other windows are in the right half. What's important here is that the amount of windows to the left is fixed. There's always going to be two windows on the left side, and the amount of windows on the right side is variable. That's just all the rest of the windows. Uh, there are more variations. This one is called horizontal stack, where the master window just takes up the top half of the window and the rest takes up the lower half. There are more variations. For example, you can have the master on the right side as well, and so on. I'm not going to show all of those. Now, uh, this stack layout is only one possibility. There's also one layout that's called max mode or sometimes full screen mode or monocle. And here you have all the windows in full screen mode. You have a key combination to change window and you only see one at a time. And now you might say, well, but you said in tiling window management, I would always see all the windows. Why did I lie to you? Well, yeah, you're right. This is not technically tiling. This isn't really a tiling approach, right? But it's so commonly used that most tiling window managers include it anyway. And it does come in right handy, for example, when you're browsing, because I tend to browse in full screen, so I would use this kind of mode. Uh, there are more uh, modes which are actually tiling. This one is called Spiral. I think this one is kind of cool. The first window would take up half of the screen. The second window will take up half of the rest, half of the remaining place. And the third window will take up half of the rest again, and so on. And it kind of spirals inward, hence the name. Uh, and the last window will just take up all of the remaining space. Uh, and there is a variation of this that is called Windle. The only difference here is that the placement of the windows is a bit different. So instead of spiraling inwards, it dwindles to a corner. So that's all the difference. Uh, there are more modes. This one is called horizontal grid. It might look similar to the master and stack layout, but this is fundamentally different because here you don't have a fixed number of master windows. The windows are just evenly distributed between a fixed amount of rows. In this example, we have two rows and five windows. Well, five isn't divisible by two, and you can't have half a window on your screen, so you just put three in the top row and two in the bottom row. If you had eight windows open, we would have four in the top and four in the bottom. Quite easy. And you can usually change the amount of uh, rows that you have. There's also, of 
course, vertical grid. It's the same concept, only here we have a fixed amount of columns among which the windows are distributed. And now, uh, those are kind of the most common layouts in list-based tiling window management. There are some more, but I'm no not showing those right now. You're going to see one that is not on these slides in the live demo, actually. Now, as you can see, this is kind of unflexible because you have those layouts that I just presented to you and you can, of course, reorder the windows in the list, but you cannot place the window wherever you want. You cannot say, oh, I want one window to take up half of the screen, then I want another to take up one quarter, and then I want three more next to each other in the remaining quarter. You can't do that with list-based tiling. List-based tiling is, uh, kind of has these fixed layouts and you cannot re really change them. Uh, well, you cannot change one specific layout, but you can easily switch between layouts, and that is the advantage of list-based tiling window management. You can easily say, okay, I want now to switch from spiral mode to master stack mode, and I want to switch from full screen mode to grid mode, for example, because the order of windows would remain the same. The only thing that has to change is their placement. So the internal structure that the tiling manager has, this disordered list, that one wouldn't need to be changed if you just swap layout. And this is easy for a tiling window manager to do. So uh, you, this is kind of trade-off. It's less flexible. You can't do whatever you want, but you can easily influence the way it looks with a single keystroke. Now, what is tree-based tiling? This is, as I mentioned, a fundamentally different approach. Here, the windows are not stored in a list, but instead in a tree. Now, if you've never heard of trees as a data structure, uh, then don't worry. I hope it will become clear in the example. You can actually think of nested containers. Like I have the entire screen. This is one box, and this, this box contains two more boxes, and the left box contains a window, and the right box contains two more boxes, which each contain a window. And what's special is here is that each internal node, so each box, can have its own layout mode. So it's a lot more flexible. You can achieve a lot more with this. Now here's an example. This is a small tree that represents uh, three windows that are open currently. And on the uh, right side, you can see what it looks like. Uh, now here, what we have is... Uh, uh, this little circle here, this is an internal node, and this is actually the root of the tree, because as is usual in computer science, trees grow from top to bottom, right? Seems logical. So this is the root of the tree, this is an internal node, and those ABC here, these represent the actual windows that are opened, and these are called leaves of the tree, because they're, you know, at the end of the tree. There's no more branches going off from them. And... You can see this root node represents the entire rectangle of the screen. And it is divided in two parts. One part contains only A, that's the left part here. The other part contains an internal node, which is kind of a box that contains more windows. And this internal node is split in two again and contains B and C on top of each other. And uh, another a note on terminology, B and C in this example are called, called brothers or siblings. And the internal node here would be a parent of B and C, and the root is a parent of A and this internal node. This is just for naming. It's not that important. Now, in this example, we have one problem. It is ambiguous. It could also mean this. We don't know if uh, an internal node has two branches like this. We don't know whether it's on top of each other or next to each other. We have to specify this because we want our layer to be uh, unambiguously defined by this tree. So we have to specify for each node whether it is horizontally split or vertically split. And now I've added this to the nodes and now it is no longer ambiguous. You know exactly that this tree represents this window layout. Now, I hope everybody is still following up so, uh, so far. All right. Now we're going to open a new window, new window D and we want this to be between the A window and the B, C window, so right in the middle here. It want, we want it to take up the, the center third and the others to be pushed to the left and right to it. How will we do that? How would we do it? Any ideas? Put it at the top of the, the top uh, separation. Here? A, B, and then Here? Exactly, that's what we're going to do. Replace D in between A and this internal node. And that's exactly what happens. D is now in between A and the rest. I hope everybody sees how what just happened, right? Now we're going to add more windows. 
And now we want to do something special. Now we want a new window that is between A and D, but we don't want it to be like the same size as A and D and the rest. We want it to be half of A. So we want this window to be here. We want D to retain its current size. How would we do that? Any ideas? Chris? Exactly, that's what we're doing. So A is going to be replaced by a dot, an internal node, just like this one here. And then we will have two new windows. One is still A, the next is our new window. This is what it looks like. And you notice here, I specified this internal node to be horizontally split, because I said I want E to be in between A and D. Does everybody see what happened here? Awesome, now we're going to open some more windows. How exciting. Uh, I want to open two more windows now, and I want those to be below E. You know, uh, I want E to be at the top here, and then I want a new window in the middle and another at the bottom, right? Any ideas? How do I do that? Don't be lazy, right? E becomes an internal node with three children, one of them E. All right, perfect. That's what we're doing. And this internal node would be horizontal or vertical? Right, correct, perfect. You already know what's going on here. So this is what it looks like now. And as you can see, this can get arbitrarily complicated. But here you can actually achieve any layout you could imagine, as long as it's still tiling, of course. You can place your windows wh wherever you want, and you can split up your screen in whatever way you want. This is a lot more flexible, but it's more complicated. Because every internal node has is its own layout, and every internal layout can be changed individually. So you can, for example, take one specific internal node and switch it from horizontal to vertical, and then everything is going to be reordered. It's a lot more complicated. And if you want to use this efficiently, you ne kind of need to know what's going on. You need to know this tree concept, uh, because otherwise you're going to be constantly confused as to uh, why is this window exactly there? Why can't I just move it over there? I kind of don't understand what's going on. I know one guy. He started using a tiling window manager for the first time, and it was tree-based, and he kind of didn't know this tree concept. And he was constantly like, wait, how did you do that? I never get this kind of layout on my setup. I don't know how to do that. And I just, well, you just move this window to this other container, and then you kind of switch it to vertical. And he was like, what? Yeah, yeah, it's like organized in a tree. Aha! Uh -huh. He didn't know that. And then he kind of, it constantly confused him. He didn't know why these windows were placed in this way. So if you want to use a tree-based window manager, you kind of need to know this tree concept. You kind of need to get a hang of it in order to actu actually effectively use it. But it's not that hard. If you know about trees, you kind of get the hang of it after one day. So that's it for tiling algorithms. Do you have any questions about this topic? No? Great, then let's go on. Now, I've said I'm going to explain to you how you can install a window manager on your own system, but first, there's one thing you need to know. A window manager is not a desktop environment. It's part of a desktop environment, but it's not going to replace everything in your desktop environment. And uh, you, you know, a window manager doesn't include like a status bar where you can see your battery level or a system tray where you can see your network uh, connections. Uh, it does not include a launcher, that's like a start menu where you can start your programs. It doesn't have those kind of things. Things. So you will need additional software to replace those components of your desktop environment. And I'm now going to tell you a bit what you will need in addition to your window manager in order to be able to use your system again. There are some components of your desktop environment that you can reuse for your window manager. You know, if you install XFC, for example, you will have a text editor. It's called Mousepad. If you install KD, you will have Kate as a text editor. It's automatically included. If you have GNOME, you will also get GNOME Terminal as a terminal emulator. You will get Evans as a PDF viewer. You will get Eye of Gnome, which can view images. Everything, everything, it's already included. And those programs, you can still use them in your tiling window manager. They programs like any other. You can open them like any other. And, well, then we, they will be automatically tiled, but they're still usable. And there's one specific component that you already have that's kind of important. I'm going to mention this again later on. You already have a login ma manager, I'm assuming. And if you don't have one, you probably know you don't. So 
The login manager is what you see just after you boot your PC when you enter your password so to login. That's why it's called login manager, of course. You already have that, and this is going to become important later. But first, let's talk about programs that you will need. You know, your desktop environment already has those kinds of programs, but they are so well integrated in your desktop environment that they cannot be used on their own. For example, XFC has a launcher, it's called XFC Whisker Menu, but it works so well together with XFC so that it cannot work without XFC. So you can't reuse it in your tiling window manager. You need a separate program, and I have listed some examples on these slides. Uh, this is mainly for reference. You can download the slides after the course and then you can look those up and kind of Google these kinds of programs, see what they look like and then decide which one you like best and install it. So these are just examples. I haven't even tested all of them, to be honest. You will see some of those uh, in the live demo, actually. Uh, you will need a launcher. I already mentioned that. That's the program that starts other programs, like the start menu, as it is known. Uh, the status bar you will need, that's usually where you see what kinds of windows you have open and you also see your like battery level, your network connection status, all those things. You will need a system tray, that's where all these little icons go for your network manager and your clipboard and everything. You will need a notification service, that's a program that's responsible for generating these annoying pop-ups that say, hey, you're now connected to the ETH Wi-Fi network. You will need a lock screen because uh, usually the lock screen is a part of your desktop environment and can't be easily reused. There are exceptions to this. Some lock screens do work outside of their desktop environment, but not, lo not all of them. And you will also need something that sets your wallpaper. Your desktop environment does it for you. Your tiling window manager doesn't, so you will need an external program to do it. Now, uh, I've told you you will need this, but it's not necessarily true. I've lied to you again, because some window managers include some of those features already. There are window managers that come with a status bar included. There are window managers that actually do set your wallpaper for you. Some even include a system tree. And that is another kind of idiom that you have to decide on. Do you want your window manager to be feature rich? Do you want it to already include everything of this? Or do you want it to be minimal? Do you want to like install every component separately? But the advantage of that would be that you get to choose every component of your system and it's going to be your own system, TM. It's something that you have to decide on and it might influence your choice of window manager. If you just want something that works out of the box, you're going to choose a feature-rich window manager. If you want to do s have something that's exactly what you need, then you're going to want a minimal one. Now, back to login managers. Well, installing a window manager is easy. You just use your package manager on your system. You go, for example, if you want window manager i3, you go sudo apt-get install i3 or sudo super install i3 or sudo pacman minus s i3, whatever. Uh, but that's not everything you need to do. Somehow you need to get your system to actually start i3 instead of xfc, say. And that is done through your login manager. I've already told you that your login manager is a program that lets you log in, uh, but it doesn't belong to your desktop environment. It's a separate standalone program. And what it does is when you've entered your password and hit enter, it will start your desktop environment for you. And now we want this login manager to not start my desktop environment, but instead start i3, my window manager. And how do you do that? Well, usually we have a drop-down menu somewhere in our login manager, like here, this little menu that we can click on, and there we get a choice of sessions that we can start. And you see this is from my system. I have quite many window managers installed, and I can now choose between them. Do I want to start XFC? No, I want to start Awesome, for example, or i3. And I get to choose now. And usually this works out of the box. I say usually because sometimes it doesn't. For example, I have another window manager installed. It's called DWM. It's not in that list because when I install DWM, the necessary files that are putting DWM in this list weren't win installed with it. And well, usually that's not that much of a problem. You just Google how to start DWM and then maybe include your distro name to get better results. And usually you will find straightforward tutorials that you can follow and then it's all set up. And you only need to do this once after installation and then it's gonna work forever ideally. 
but it's just something you, to keep in mind. If your window manager doesn't show up, up in your menu, it kind of depends on which distro you use, which desktop environment you use, which window manager you install. It kind of depends. Sometimes it works, sometimes it just doesn't. And the first step then is to Google. So now to the fun part, whoops, to the window manager demo. I have some aspects that I'm going to highlight in those different window managers. I've already mentioned two of them that would be uh, the tiling algorithm. Of course, it's kind of important whether it's list or tree based. Uh, the amount of features they already include. And there are some more that I'm going to talk about. One is the multi-head behavior. That basically means what happens if I have more than one monitor? Because it's also the job of the window manager to kind of handle your monitors. Uh, so to say which window belongs to which monitor and which workspace shows up on which monitor. There, there are really different approaches to do this. You're going to see uh, various uh, different examples for this. Uh, then workspaces themselves can be managed differently. They can, for example, be created dynamically as they are in the GNOME desktop environment. They can be created statically as they are in XFC. Or they can behave as tags. I don't know any desktop environment who does that, but there, there are numerous tiling window managers who do. And I'm not going to explain what this is now because you will see it in the demo. Then the configuration is important. Window managers are usually not configured through a GUI where you can click and then you want, can tick I want this and this and this and this feature. Instead, they are configured in a file. And this configuration file can be anything from actually programming code that you modify or just some bash script that configures your window manager. There are varying... Uh, approaches and the major trade-off here is either your configuration is simple and straightforward but not as powerful or the configuration can achieve anything you could imagine in your window manager but it is complicated as heck. So that is one trade-off that you have. You can kind of need to decide how much time do I want to spend configuring my window manager to my needs. There are some other points, of course. Some window managers are scriptable from the outside, some aren't. You're going to see examples for this. Then uh, some window managers actually have uh, the possibility to save and restore the current layout tree. This one only makes sense for tree-based window managers, of course. But then you can kind of store your current tree to a file and restore it later on so that you can uh, pick up where you left off. So, and now these are the window managers that I'm going to show you today. There are six of them, and I've picked those six because they're the most widely used, and they're also all still being actively developed. There are many window managers that are kind of dead, no longer being developed, they don't get any updates, and that's a bad thing, so I'm not showing you those in the first place. So, uh, let's get started, shall we? This is our first window manager. It's called BSPWM, which stands for binary something, uh, it, it says in, so, sorry? It's binary space partitioning. Uh, binary space partitioning window manager, right. Thank you. Um, I didn't know that until just before the course, actually. <laughs> and you can see it kind of looks really simple. You see a very simple bar. It is actually not even included with the window manager. It's a standalone program that I've included because, uh, you know, I'm not showing you the window managers as they are out of the box because I don't see the point in that. Some window managers are really useless out of the box. They need to be configured and they need additional programs so that they even work at all. And if I just show you them unconfigured, you go home and be like, well, this window manager, this was really crap. Who would even want that? And I don't want that. I, wa I want to show you the potential. I want to show you what you can make of those window managers. And that's why I've used ev each and every window manager for at least one week. I've configured them until I deemed them usable, and I'm showing you those. And the configuration files that I've created uh, during the course of this testing phase, they're actually online. I have a Git repository made for them, and you can download them and use them for yourself if you want. So there's that. This is BSPWM with a separate status bar program. Uh, this little window down there, this is a second monitor. It's kind of simulating a second monitor, a tiny one, because I do want to show you what the window managers do when there are several monitors attached. So we need an additional monitor, and there it is. Now let's open some windows, and now you can guess whether this one is list-based or tree-based, right? What do you think? What do you think now? Now? Still no idea? 
No? What do you think? Three. Right, this is one is tree based. Actually, at this point, it could still be a list based one in the spiral layout. And it actually continues that way. And if I open more windows, it still looks spirally. But look, I can actually do uh, this if it works. If, uh, I keep forgetting the key combinations. They're all different in every window manager, so I'm going to need this cheat sheet here. It's really, you have to learn key combinations in order to use them because they're keyboard driven. And you will only need to learn one window manager. I had to learn six, and I keep messing them up. So I'm really sorry for this. It actually was control. Yeah, right. Now you can see it's tree based. What just happened? I took this window and I went and said, I want to split up this window and open a new one in the same container, so to say. And then I hit this key combination and then it w made this uh, yellow rectangle. Actually, the color looks a lot nicer on my screen than on the projection. Whatever. Uh, this means this uh, window half has now been pre-selected and the next window that I'm going to open will be at that position. And I can now go and open a window, for example. Uh, this is the menu. It's a very simple launcher and I believe Sandra has already showed this to you in the Unleash the Power course. I can just now type the name of the program I want to open, for example, Tunar, which is a file manager. And then as soon as it opens, it's going to take up that space that's previously been yellow. So pretty straightforward it is. And I can, of course, also close windows with a key combination. And what happens, they just uh, take, uh, the, their brother is going to take up the entire space. So you see this is tree-based and this is actually uh, a special kind of tree. It's a binary tree. Binary tree means that each and every internal node has exactly two children. So no more and no less. You cannot have three windows next to each other as we had in my example on the slides. So you could say this is kind of limiting, but I have to say uh, usually it's not that much of a deal. You can still do most of the layouts with a binary tree. And you can actually place three windows next to each other. I can just take this one, split it in half, and then I can uh, select this one again and change the aspect ratio. I just have to look up how. Right. And now there are three windows next to each other. The only difference is, yeah, they are not exactly the same kind of window. They're not all brothers. The file manager window is actually uh, an uncle to the other windows, so, this, so to say. So they don't have the same status. But, well, for the looks, it doesn't matter what status they have. They look the same, right? So let me just restart this uh, uh, splitting ratio. Oops. Right. Uh, so what else do we have to say about BSPWM? You've seen in the top bar we have several workspaces. We're here on monitor one and we have workspaces one to four. And I can, of course, switch between them. And when I'm on workspace two, I don't see the windows anymore that have been on workspace one and vice versa, of course. Uh, this is normal. This concept is well known. Even in stacking window managers, I'm not going to explain this in any more detail. What's special here is how the workspaces are managed. You can see all four workspaces already exist. That means they are statically created in the beginning and they will persist until the end. They don't disappear even if they empty. And now those four workspaces are all on monitor one. What happens if I switch to monitor two? Now you see I'm on monitor two. It says in the status bar I've actually configured the status bar to stay on monitor one because monitor two is just too small to contain it. So this is something I myself configured. You will, of course, want to have the status bar on every monitor, I'm going to assume. So now I'm on a monitor two. And you see here I have workspaces five to eight. So m monitor two has its own set of workspaces. F workspaces five to eight belong to monitor two. And this kind of... Uh, uh, matching up monitors and workspaces, this cannot just be changed. This is defined somewhere in the configuration and it stays. So if I go to workspace one now, which is on monitor one, and I open a window, and now I'm going to move this window to workspace five, what do you think? Where does it go? Hmm? Any ideas? Chris? You're right, thank you. It does go to monitor two. You can see now it shows up down there and uh, it doesn't show up entirely because the monitor is so tiny, but yeah, it can't be helped. And if I switch to workspace five now, then the focus is actually also switching to monitor two. So you see, 
If I move this window to a workspace that belongs to monitor one, it is automatically also moved to the other monitor. This is kind of straightforward, like why am I even explaining this? It's, it's so easy, right? But other Windows managers are doing this differently, so I just highlighted once now so that you kind of know, right? Now, uh, BSPWM actually has multiple layout modes. Aside from tree layout, you also have... Uh, full screen layout and now every window is full screened this is something that i showed you among the list based window managers and it's also more common in list based window managers but bspwm uh, the guy who develops bspwm decided to include it anyway because it's kind of handy right and i can actually switch windows now with a key combination so that's cool. It's just a different layout mode. You might notice that this little icon up here has changed now. This indicates that I'm now in full screen mode. If I go back to tiling mode, then it changes back to the tiling icon, right? And I can, of course, also take one specific window, for example, this Merrill Street window down here, and I can also full screen this specifically. Now, I cannot change windows with my key combination because only this window is full screened. And if I tile it back, then it's going to be where it was before. The difference here is that in, in full screen mode, you actually still see the status bar. And if I full screen this window individually, you don't. And I can also do one little neat trick. I can make this window floating. What happened now? It covers up other windows. Now this is really bad. And I can move it around with my mouse. Well, this is pretty bad. This is not tiling anymore. Why is this even including here? I, I, I've promised you tiling window managers. Why am I doing this? Well, the reason is... Uh, well, for terminals, this might not make sense, but it does for dialog boxes. You know, dialog boxes, these annoying little windows that pop up and say, do you really want to quit without saving? Uh, those kinds of boxes, they show up once, and within five seconds, you will already have them closed again. And if they were to actually take up a space in your tiling setup, they would mess up the entire layout, because the window manager would need to free some space for them and move around other windows so that there is space, and then the box goes in that space, and then you close it again, and then all the changes from before are just undone. And it kind of, kind of annoys when you just have this tiny little box show up and all your windows are moved aside for it. So for dialog boxes, this floating mode does make sense. And that is also the reason why every tiling window manager actually has a floating mode. Because, yeah, well, dialog boxes. So, uh, but usually you don't need to worry about it because dialog boxes actually tell the window manager that they are dialog boxes and the window manager then knows, oh, I'm going to automatically put this into floating mode. So... Uh, yeah, now I'm going to show you the configuration of BSPWM because I've promised you configuration, so let's look at that. Uh, whoops. This is going to happen often uh, because I have two window managers running at the same time and I kind of mess up the key combinations. All right, this is the configuration of BSPWM. And as you see in the top line here, whoops, it's a bash script. It's a simple bash script that is run once as you start up BSPWM. And yeah, it's kind of straightforward. And you see it repeatedly calls this little program that's called BSPC. This is uh, binary space partition control, I guess. And you can see you can set some configuration options, like the default split ratio. I want uh, all windows to have the, the same size by default. Like when two are next to each other, they should also have the same size. Uh, I want the full screen mode to not have a border. I want the... Uh, several other configuration. I don't even know, remember all of those. And here is where I set up my workspaces. I want the monitor LVDS1 to have workspaces 1 to 4. The monitor uh, VGA1 is supposed to have monitor uh, workspaces 8, 9, and 10. You see, this is not the exact same configuration that I am using in this demo here. This is the configuration that I use in my setup at home. So it it's, has some slight difference, just that I said it once. Then here I'm defining rules. These rules basically say, okay, Firefox will always be on Workspace 2. And Telegram will always be on Workspace 1. And you can set those or you cannot. It's up to you whether you want them. I kind of find it handy because then I know just Workspace 2 is reserved for browsing. And if I want to browse, I just go to Workspace 2. 
it's kind of handy to have. And every window manager that I'm showing to you has these kinds of rules, so I'm only going to show them once, and now you know that this exists. Here I'm automatically starting some programs. For example, I always have Telegram and Firefox open, so I auto-start them. And here I start Dunst. Dunst is a notification service. I've mentioned what that is. And here I'm starting my panel. I've told you that the panel that you see here is not part of BSPWM. It's a separate program. So I have to start it somewhere. And I do that in the BSPWM configuration because this file is run anyway when I start BSPWM. But first, let's look at this BSPC program. BSPC is a normal command line utility that you can use and you can give it commands like for, for example node minus c. What happens now? I've told bspwm to close the currently active window and there it went. So, uh, right, there, there we go. bspc can actually influence what your window manager does. This means you can write bash scripts with BSPC that, for example, move all the windows on your current workspace to another workspace, or that close all the windows you have currently open, or you could write a bash script that moves everything to the other monitor, or whatever, you, you name it. You can script anything from bash using this BSPC utility that can actually communicate with your window manager. And that's what I've mentioned in the previous slide. This is what I mean by scriptable. This BSPC utility allows me to influence the behavior of my window manager. This is pretty cool, actually. And BSPWM actually takes this pretty far. BSPWM is so minimal, it doesn't even handle key bindings by itself. But usually, you have your, all your key combinations, and usually it's the window manager who handles them, but BSPWM does not handle them by himself, it uses a separate program to handle key combinations. Now this other program, it's called SXHKD, which is for simple X hotkey daemon, and it's actually written by the same guy that I also wrote BSPWM. They work quite well together, they're quite reliable. And now B, uh, SXHKD has its own configuration file, and uh, this is what it looks like. Basically we first define what keys I want to press, then we define what happens. And here this key combination to lock my screen. The interesting part is down here. These are the BSPWM hotkeys. And you see, each and every key combination just calls BSPC in order to do the, something. Here, the top one says, basically, if I hit this key combination, I just want to, uh, oops, I want to quit BSPC, BSPWM entirely. Here, this is what I've typed in my terminal. This closes the current window. And here, uh, this switches to the next desktop layout. This is also what I showed you. It switches between the tiling layout and the full screen layout. Uh, this here selects the window that has previously been active. Uh, this here switches between floating mode and full screen mode for single windows, not for all of your windows. Uh, there, so, so kind of everything you can do by, via key bindings is actually just done through BSPC. Sandro? What does super mean? Uh, super is a uh, key on my keyboard. It's usually the Windows key. Under Mac, it would be the command key. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, kind of the official name for that key on every PC. Not, I mean, I would call it the Windows key because I have a PC that originally had Windows on it, and there's a Windows logo on it. So for me, it's the Windows key. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, Sandra. Good question. Uh, the others should be quite uh, straightforward. I mean, T would be the T key, sh Shift would be the Shift key, Alt would be the Alt key. Easy, all right? So is everybody still following so far? Awesome, right. Uh, what else am I telling you about BSPWM? All right, the status bar. I kept telling you that this is not included with BSPWM, but you see, it contains workspace information. How does it know? How does it know on which workspace I currently am? So, well, the easy answer is BSPC, right? BSPC knows a command that's called subscribe. And what this does is it outputs some gibberish in my terminal. And if I open a new window, whoops, sorry, this was the wrong window manager again. This is going to happen often, get used to it. Uh, if I open another window, this is more gibberish. If I go to a different monitor, I see even more gibberish. And now, what does this all mean? Whoops, sorry. Uh, you can see here, we have a 
a capital W, that's window manager output, a capital M, that means currently active monitor. Then we get the name of the monitor, monitor 01. You can see that in the status bar, actually. Then we have a separator. Now comes the first workspace on this monitor. Here's a small O, that means this workspace is occupied. There are windows on it, but it's not currently visible. Uh, just give me one more minute, right? Capital O means the wor workspace is currently occupied and visible. And here we have a F that stands for the workspace is free. There are no windows on it. And here we have the same again for the second monitor, except here we have a, a small M that means this monitor is currently not focused. So that's what BSBC does subscribe gives me. And my status bar will parse that into pretty output. And I'm going to tell you how this pretty output uh, is made after the break, right? The going to have a 10 minute break now. So I promised you that I will, could, would show you how this power on the top of working, is working. I've already showed you how it gets the information from BSPWM, where on which workspace I am and such. And I'm going to show you how it's actually prettifying this output to make this nice bar. This bar is an external program. This is called Lemon Bar in this example. And Lemon Bar does nothing more than just taking some text from somewhere and displaying it in a bar. And that text will then contain, you know, text that say which color goes where and all. But this text has to be preformatted by some other program. And in this ca case, this other program is a simple bash script. This is it. First, we just define some colors, a lot of colors actually. Then we do some cleaning up. For example, if there's been a previous bar running, we want to kill everything it started. And then here comes the interesting part. Here, here we call this subscribe command. This is from an older version of BSPWM. That's why it looks a bit different. Uh, uh, BSPWM is still being very actively developed. And uh, recently, the entire configuration syntax has changed. Uh, you don't need to worry about it because the changes are now already made. Uh, but I have, during the week, actually, I used BSPWM. I've noticed that there is a new release and all the syntax was different. Uh, this is because BSPWM is pretty new, but it is already, uh, I, I consider it stable. Uh, so that's why this command differs. Then here, down here, is the function that looks at the text I'm getting and parses it. Now we have several kinds of text. Here we have clock output. Battery output, I have actually not included this one because this laptop does not include a battery. I've taken it out because it was dying. So I don't need a battery status. I don't have a battery. Why would I? Uh, here is title output. The title you see the actually here in the BSPC. This command does not include the window title anywhere, but my status bar knows the window title. It's displayed up there. And that's actually done through another program that's called xtitle. And that just displays the current window title. Simple as that. So my status bar program calls a program that gives me the date, the program that gives me the title, and the BSPWM subscribe command. It gets text from them, and then it imp interprets this text. For example, here it looks, OK, we split this text we get at every colon. Then we look, does it start with an M? OK, then it has to be in a monitor. And then we have the case where it's a capital M, that's the active monitor, or a small M, that's the inactive monitor. And then we get this informations variable, WM informations, and then we set that to a lot of text, and here most of this is actually coloring. Here we input the active monitor foreground color and the active monitor background color, and then we output the monitor name and then uh, some formatting. So f this this actually cancels the background color change, and this uh, minus F here cancels the foreground color change. Uh, there's a lot of uh, formatting going on. This formatting is then understood by Lemon Bar, and Lemon Bar then makes this pretty coloring out of it. So here we have an inactive monitor, then we have focused occupied desktop. This has a different color than a focused free desktop, which again has a different color from a focused urgent desktop and an occupied desktop that is not focused, and so on and so forth. All these kind of um, codes that we've seen uh, are interpreted here. And here we have another one that's layout. We did see that in the output, actually. Here it says LT. That means the current layout I have is the, the tiling layout. And the other option would be M for, no, I think it's F for full screen. Um, oops, sorry. 
So this is where this output from BSPWM is interpreted. And you see, this is just a back bash script. Actually, I didn't even write this myself. I've taken this from the internet somewhere. Basically, if you have BSPWM and you're like, oh, I want a status bar, but I have no idea of how to program one, then you just Google BSPWM status bar, and you will find an abundance of scripts that work together with an abundance of panels. This one is for lemon bar. There are other kinds of bar, for example, Descent2 or um, Xmobar, which we're going to both see later on. And then you will find working examples that you can use and modify for your own system. You can also download uh, this one. I've put it in my Git repository. I've promised you can use all my configurations. Uh, I've actually modified it a little. The original version from Jack um, looks a bit different than this file. Uh, sorry, yeah? What's the point of having those steps between the windows? It looks pretty. Well, of course, it's a matter of opinion whether you like this or not. In my personal opinion, it's a waste of space, but it's actually quite uh, trendy right now. Many people use this because it does look nice, I admit that. And yeah, that's kind of the only point. It also makes it easier to distinguish which window is where, because in most other window managers, you just have thin frames and make kind of makes it harder to distinguish them. Yeah? Is it also possible to mix uh, workspaces and monitors? So one, two, three workspaces. One is on monitor one, two on monitor two. And workspace three is on both of them? Uh, no, you cannot have a workspace on both monitors because a window cannot be displayed at two places at once. If you had workspace free on both monitors and you switch to workspace free, then what happens? Is the, is the window placed on monitor one or two? Or do you mean one workspace that expands over both monitors? No, but more like a duplicate output. So ah. Yeah, well, but this is actually more complicated because having a duplicate screen output that will require to actually switch your screen output mode. And you could probably write the bash script uh, that recognizes when you switch to monitor 3 and then change the screen output mode for you so that it is now in duplicate mode. Uh, but it would be kind of hacky and it would like turn off both of your screens and then turn them back on in the new mode. I, I, don't, I don't think it would be smooth or anything, uh, but it would be possible, of course, but it's not a job of your window manager to do that. You, have an, you had another? Okay, all right. Any other questions? Uh, this overview, by the way, I'm not going to tell you anything about it because I've said all, everything already. If I've forgotten something, please tell me. Uh, this is just for you if you want to download the slides after this course so that you still know what window manager had which special features, right? So uh, I'm going to show you the next window manager now. This one is called DWM. Uh, I've forgotten to close the windows. I'm sorry about this. Uh, DWM has been around for quite a while. It's one of the older window managers. Um, this one is list-based and it comes with the status bar included, actually, this one. Uh, so let's look what happens. If I open some windows here, you immediately see this. this is the master and stack layout. And yeah, you see it's quite straightforward. You have the master on the left side and the stack on the right side. Actually here the stack is not exactly half the screen, but the master is a bit larger than half of the screen. But you can change this somehow. I just need to find out. No, that was not it. It was changing monitor. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really have all those different key combinations that I need to know. So then if it wasn't this, it was that. No. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I just increased the number of master windows. I've, I've showed you N master mode. I can uh, modify the amount of master windows. I want Now I have three. The amount of master windows stays con constant. If I open more windows, they are put to the right side of the screen, right? So let me decrease this again. Now, how again did I change it? I'm really sorry about this. I couldn't memorize all of them. Um, all right. Of course, it's H and L. Yeah, I, I can change the size of the master window in res with respect to the stack windows. So this is actually quite straightforward. And I've promised you that those list-based tiling window managers would have more layouts than just master stack. This one has only three of them. One is master stack. The on the other is is full screen mode. Actually, DWM is uh, calling it Monocle, and that's where the name Monocle is coming from. And here I can 
uh, of course, cycle between my windows. Then the last mode uh, is called floating mode. And now, you see, uh, well, you can drag around your windows again. They're not being managed anymore. Uh, I don't use this. I have never had a case where I needed to put all my windows in floating mode. This is probably here because, as I said, DWM is pretty old and maybe earlier on people thought they would actually need this. Because, you know, actually tiling window management was first and the very first computer only could do this in an even more simple, simplistic way, actually. And then uh, I think some windows came with, which first had this stacking approach and then it was so pop popular that every, everybody just adapted it. Maybe that's why it actually includes stacking mode. But uh, I never use it and most people actually don't. And yeah, it's just here. So actually now you only have two usable layouts. If you want more, you will have to modify DWM actually. I'm going to talk about this later on. Uh, you do again have several workspaces actually here. They are not called workspaces, they are tags. Now what are tags? I'm going to show you. Tags actually can do everything a workspace can do as well. I can open windows on them, I can switch between them, but they can do more. <coughs> here with tags I can actually display several of them at once. I can now display tag 1 and 2 at the same time and now I see all the windows from both tags. So you see, I think it was the kill ugly radio window that's on workspace 2, right? It's not in tag 1, uh, but if I show both of them, then I see it. Because I see all the windows from both of them. And I can also take one window. For example, I'm going to open a new one here. The most people prefer certainty window. And I'm now going to assign this to both tag 1 and 2. You see the a little square in the corner here, it, it is now filled out. That means this window is tagged to both of those tags. And if I now switch back to tag 1, then the most people prefer certainty window is still here. It is now visible on both of them. So normal workspaces can't do this. This is only possible with this tag system. That's also why they changed the name, so that you don't uh, kind of think it's a normal workspace, because it isn't. And what you probably already also noticed is that both monitors have all nine tags present on them. So this is different from BSPWM. On BSPWM, when I said Workspace 5, then you knew that Workspace 5 would be on Monitor 2. Here you don't, because Tag 5 is on both monitors. So now if I take this window and assign it to Tag 5, on which monitor does it go? Exactly, it stays on the same monitor. Uh, whoops. Uh, if I assign this to tag, uh, Workspace 5, you see Workspace 5 is now shown as occupied, and if I go there, you actually see the window is there now. Now, how do I switch it to the other monitor? I have a separate key combination for that. And yeah, now it's on the other monitor. And what happened? To which tag on the other monitor did it go? Come on, this isn't hard. <laughs> Are my questions too stupid for you? <laughs> yeah, it, it obviously went to the currently active tag. So if, if I switch to tag 3 here, then I go to the other monitor and I move this to the other monitor. Oops, wrong key combination. Then it's going to go to tag 3 because this one is currently active. And it goes only to tag 3 and not to several tags. You would have to do that separately. For example, now I can assign into text 3 and 4, and now I see it on both of them. So this is different from BSPWM. And even though it is still quite straightforward, this difference kind of, you need to keep them in mind, because you might prefer one or the other. So you need to know which window manager does what. So uh, in DWM, when I go to my text with those few windows, I see I can move those windows around in the list. With a key combination, this bridge ahead window, I'm now moving it up and down. And if I move it up one more, it's going to become the new master window. And now if you install DWM on your own system, you're going to notice that this doesn't work. You have no way of doing this. And this is not because your window manager is not configured correctly. This is actually because I'm using a different version of DWM than you do. I'm kind of cheating. I have patched my DWM to include this feature. Now, why did I do that? I told you that I'm showing you those window managers in configured state, and I've configured them until I, seem, I deemed them usable. 
And I think DWM without any patches or modifications applied is not usable. Because, you know, right? No, their position in the list is fixed, except, uh, right, you got me there. There is one way of moving them around. There is a key combination that takes the current window and makes it the new master. This one is included by default, but that's the only way of modifying the order in the default DWM inst uh, installation. You got me there. Uh, yeah, so I personally think that DWM without any patches is not usable. It just contains too few features to be usable. Because I really want to be able to move my windows around. I think this is essential for me. So I wanted that, so I had to patch DWM. You know, DWM is being developed by a small community called Suckless. Their website Suckless the Dark, maybe you've heard of them. And they kind of said in the beginning that they want to make a window manager that uh, has simple code and they limited the amount of code to 2,000 lines. They said DWM is never to have more than 2,000 lines of code. And that's not a lot. So in these 2,000 lines, they just didn't have enough space to include this feature of moving around windows. It would have taken too many lines. Uh, they're kind of sim simplistic like that. It's their philosophy. And maybe you like the philosophy and you're like, oh, I want to have a window manager that's simple and you're fine with that. Yes, you have a question? I'm going to explain uh, that in a second now, because I went to the website of uh, Suckless uh, here. And in the DWM category, they actually have in a menu bar a category that says patches. And a patch is a small file that describes modifications that need to be done to the source code in order to include a certain feature. And you see there are a lot of patches. The one that enables me to move around Windows, it's called Stacker. You can go, go to it now here and I see a, a description. Oh, this patch provides co comprehensive utilities for managing the client stack. It basically enables me to move around Windows in the list. And you can see it kind of describes what it does and what kind of additional key bindings it introduces. And here you can download this file. It's a diff file. It describes differences to the original source code. And then I can download this diff file. And there are actually programs who can read this diff file and automatically apply those changes to the source code. So I don't even need to open the source code myself. I can just uh, type patch and then the diff file and then it automatically applies it to the source code. Uh, that's the easiest way of doing it. The best way of doing it, so to say, I followed the uh, official tutorial on Suckless.org for patching my window manager because I didn't only include this patch. I included several others. I think I have a total of seven patches applied. And, you know, the patch only describes the difference between the original source code and this new feature. And if I already have a patch applied, it might be that those patches conflict. And this is a bad thing, because then I have to go and manually apply both patches. Uh, but it's not as scary as it sounds. Basically, uh, what I did is I created a Git repository. Uh, and now I cloned the Git repository of DWM. Uh, so this is... Uh, the original DWM source code, the files that are included in it. You see, this is the DWM.c files. This is the only file that's really important because that's the entire DWM source, those 2,000 lines. Now they're actually more like 3,000 because I have so many patches applied. But yeah, uh, I'm not like that. And uh, who doesn't know how, what Git is and how it works? Who doesn't know Git? All right, there are some, well, basically, a Git allows you to have several versions of the same source code in parallel, and you can do different modification to each version, and in the end you can merge them together, so you only have one version left that has all the changes. Here's what that looks like, git log. Uh, this is the log of all the changes that I made to this source code. You see, all the way at the bottom, you see this is this Hiltio Postuma guy that's a, a developer of DWM. So these are the guys that make DWM. And then I cloned their code. This is basically a copy. And then I made my own modification. And you see those dotted dashed lines at the border? These are changes that I made in parallel. And I applied each different patch on its own. It's called branch. And then I started merging them together. And in the end, I was left with 
one final version that contained all my patches, and that's what I then installed on my system. And now, of course, this is the complicated way of doing it. There are easier ways, but in these easier ways, you're a bit less flexible when you have conflicts. Uh, so, uh, I, went, I then went and installed my patch DWM, and then I had all these features. Whoops, wrong window manager, I'm sorry. Then I had all these features. I could then move around windows in the stack. Also, a new feature that has been added through the patches. If I open a new window here and change the layout to Monocle, in unpatched DWM, it will change the layout on every workspace. But here in my patched version, it only changes the layout on, on this specific tag. That's something I really want to have. It's kind of a basic functionality that I expect my window manager to have, so I included the patch for that. Now you might ask, well, yeah, these patches are all fine, but you know, other window managers have this uh, as a default functionality. Why, why would I use DWM if I can have, for example, Xmonad, which already has everything by default? Well, the advantage of those patches is that you get to choose exactly those that you actually need, and you can exclude everything you don't need. And another advantage is, you've seen it on the website, there, are, there is an awful lot of those patches. And some of them include like basic functionality that you need, and some others include some quite advanced stuff that I haven't seen in any other window manager. For example, there's... Uh, one patch that's called swallowing or uh, there it is swallow what this one does i'm going to show you normally if i go to a terminal and i launch a program from the terminal for example evans my pdf viewer what normally happens is that evans is opened beside the terminal so i have now two windows the terminal and evans and while evans is running i cannot use the terminal because in the terminal there's a program running that is Evans, but Evans is, is in a separate window, so I can't use the terminal anymore. And what this swallowing patch does, if I now open Evans here, then Evans is gonna swallow the terminal. I don't see the terminal anymore, it's disappeared. And I don't need to see it anyway, because I can't use it anyway. This is pretty cool. I've never seen this functionality in any other window manager and I actually really like this. I would want to have this in every window manager. Uh, but unfortunately I can only have it in DWM because in DWM it's so easy to create patches. And that is because the DWM source code is only 2000 lines long. Question? Yes? Does it also swallow if you run the command in the background? In the, sorry? If you add an ampersand after. Uh, I haven't tried this, let's try. Yes, it does. <laughs> no problem, no problem. All right, right. All right. So that's the advantage of pack, uh, patches. Because the source code is so simple, the patches can be add quite some new functionality that you don't see in other window managers traditionally. So, uh, yeah, about the configuration of DWM. Uh, because DWM is only 2,000 lines of code long, the developers did not have the space to write the configuration file parser. File parser that actually reads the configuration file and interprets the th stuff that it says there and then applies the specific configurations for that. DWM does not have that. That means that the configuration of DWM actually happens within the source code. This is what it looks like. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's see. Yes, this is DWM. And this is actual C code. It's a C header file. This is actual source code. And if you want to configure DWM, you will need to modify this source code. It's not that much of a deal because much of mo most of the stuff is just copy and paste. For example, if you want to have an additional key binding, these are all the key bindings that are defined. Here, mod key is my modifier key. I've set this to be the super key, the Windows key. And then I have a shift mask. That means if I hit mod and also shift and Q, then I want to kill the currently active window. And this is kind of how it works. There's there first there's the modifier, which is either the Windows key or the Alt key or the Control key or the Shift key or any combination of those. Then I have the actual key that I press in, adi in addition. That's usually a letter. Then I have the function, what happens? For example, here spawn. Spawn means open a, another program. Here, for example, I open D menu. 
that which is the launcher. Here I open my terminal. Here, uh, actually, this is a program that makes a screenshot. Uh, so the configuration happens in the source code, and that means that after configuring DWM, you will have to recompile and reinstall it so that the configuration takes effect. Because it's, if it's only in the source code, it's not going to help anyone. It needs to be in the actual binary that's running on your system. And for that, you need to recompile your program. That's not that much of a deal. It's pretty easy. It's a matter of typing two commands in your terminal, and then you're all fine. It sounds a lot scarier than it actually is. And you will find tutorials on the net that explain it really well. So that's it about DWM. Um, do you have any questions? No, great. Then the next window manager I've already mentioned it today is oops is called Xmonad, and Xmonad I've already said it is in many ways similar to DWM. It has kind of the same functionality, so it's also list based, and it also comes with the master and stack layout, and it does also has only few other layouts. For example, it has uh, how do I say layout? Yeah, right. It has this master and stack layout, and that can, of course, uh, increase and decrease the amount of master windows. Then it has this, it's called mirrored master mode, where the master is at the top and the rest at the bottom. Actually, in DWM, uh, in Xmonad, it's called tall mode. They just used a different name for it, because there are no standardized names. Then I have uh, full screen mode. And now I'm back to master, so these are all the modes I get. I don't have floating mode here, but uh, usually you don't need that anyway, so why would you have it? But there are some differences between Xmonad and DWM. And the most notable one is, you see, I only have two workspaces right now. One is on the first monitor and the other is on the second monitor that you just barely see down there. Uh, if I switch to workspace 2 now, what do you think happens? Yeah? Uh, that's a good guess. It's kind of what GNOME does with its workspaces, but that's not what actually happens. Let's try. I switch to workspace 2 now. What happens? Uh, right. Uh, workspace 2 has previously been on monitor 1 and uh, monitor 2 and now I've been on monitor 1 and I want to view workspace 2 here. So what does it do? It fetches workspace 2 to the first monitor and now the second monitor has no workspace left which cannot be a works uh, a monitor does always have an, an active workspace. So workspace 1 which has previously been here is now uh, pushed to monitor 2. So those workspaces kind of swapped place. And this is pretty awesome. I can uh, now go back to workspace 1 and then they switch back again, for example. And if I go to workspace 3 now, workspace 3 is going to be newly created. And now this is really like uh, what GNOME does. If I go to a new workspace that doesn't exist yet, it is created for me. And if I go away from a workspace that is empty, then it is destroyed for me, because an empty workspace that's not visible anywhere is not needed, obviously, so we can just put it away. Uh, but there has to be always at least one sp workspace per monitor, so monitor 2 right now has an active workspace that is empty. So this has to be. And if I now go to monitor 2, let me just look up how... Yeah, right. Now I'm on monitor 2, I can prove that by opening a window, right? And if I now switch to workspace 1, uh, the same thing is going to happen. The workspaces are just going to be interchanged. This is pretty cool. Actually, in my home setup, I really love this because I had three uh, monitors next to each other. And with the, for example, the BSPWM approach, I just had like uh, three or four workspaces per monitor, which is not a whole lot. And with this system, I can have like 10 workspaces that can be on any monitor. And I can just bring them to any monitor by first going to that monitor and then going to that specific workspace. And I thought it is pretty straightforward and I love this. It's, I think this is awesome. Uh, and this is uh, not special to Xmonad. There are several other window managers who do it the same way. Uh, so this is another big difference between DWM and Xmonad. They handle workspaces in an entirely different way. So um, 
Yeah, and another difference is I, I said that DWM actually includes the panel. Xmonad does not, and this panel up here is again a separate program. And this program is called Xmobar. Xmobar has been developed with Xmonad in mind, so they work kind of well together. But Xmobar is still a standalone program, and you can actually use it in other window managers. So, but this is different from BSPWM. This panel is not called through a bash script. It is actually called by Xmonad itself. So I tell Xmonad in the configuration that, hey, you will have Xmobar for a panel. And then Xmonad boots up, uh, starts up and says, hmm, Xmobar, you're going to launch now because you're going to be my panel bar. And Xmonad generates this part of the output by itself and gives it directly to the status bar. So I don't need to take a detour around a, a shell script which gets the information from Xmonad and gives it to Xmobar, but instead Xmonad gives it to Xmobar directly. So this is kind of, uh, well, you could call it a cleaner approach from a programming perspective, but it's kind of more complicated to set up. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, this is the Xmonad configuration. Xmonad, like DWM, is configured directly in its source code. But this is not C code, but it's Haskell. Haskell is a functional programming language. And if you already know programming, then Haskell is probably going to be a bit confusing. Functional program is, is kind of a fundamentally different approach to programming altogether than normal imperative programming is. So. Well, it's actually kind of cool, but in the beginning it's 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 confusing. For example, you don't get loops in Haskell. Haskell doesn't have loops. So how would you program without loops? It's kind of it's really different. Uh I suggest you give it a try. It's actually quite cool. Anyway, uh if you don't know programming at all, then the difference is not going to be important because you don't know what's going on anyway. <laughs> uh but yeah, if you just want to, for example, change a key binding, then it's still just copy and paste and kind of straightforward. Uh, this is where I tell Xmonad how it needs to format its output so that Xmobar can understand it. Actually, Xmonad and Xmobar are used together so commonly that Xmonad already includes a ready-to-use template for Xmobar in its source. And you can actually just use that, but I decided to use it and modify the colors. I, so I used the pre-def and xmobar pp template and changed some of the colors. That's all I do here. I, I have to say I don't know what pp stands for, but it's it has to do with the status bar that I use. And here is the command that I call, uh, that, that I use to start up xmobar. This has to be defined somewhere, of course. These are custom key combination that I defined. Uh, there's another toggling gaps key. And up here, this is where I tell Xmona that it should use this status bar and this PP for the status bar and this toggle key and this configuration. The configuration is defined here. Um, well, uh, what, I, what was I going to say? Uh, right. All right. Uh, when you just install Xmonad, you will notice that this file is initially empty. It is completely empty, and Xmonad is just going to use some defaults. And I suggest, especially if you don't know functional programming, I just suggest that you Google for Xmonad configuration. You grab some configuration that is already ready to use, and then you modify that rather than creating one from scratch. Because if you don't know functional programming, it's it's kind of hard. That's also what I did here. I'm actually I'm a, in computer science and we have to learn Haskell right now in this semester. But when I used Xmonad, I didn't know Haskell yet. So I just grabbed some configuration somewhere and, and off I went. So if you can do that, it's not that much of a deal. So this is how I tell Xmonad to use Xmobar. And Xmobar also has its own configuration. Xmobar, by the way, is also written in Haskell but the status bar that Xmonad used doesn't necessarily have to be in Haskell. Xmonad, Xmobar just happens to be. But this configuration is a bit more straightforward. Uh, I just, uh, For example, here I defined the network status monitor, which you can see uh, here. It tells me how much Wi-Fi I currently get. This is a keyboard layout indicator. This is a date. And this output is not generated by Xmonad, but by Xmobar. And it is configured in the Xmobar file, of course. But uh, this part of the output, this one comes directly from Xmonad. And Xmobar does nothing more than just displaying it. 
So is everything clear so far? Do you have questions regarding the status bar? Yes? Did you have to install Haskell? Uh, yeah, I did. Oh, okay. That's another kind of disadvantage. If you don't usually need Haskell anyway because you're developing in Haskell, then you will, if you want to use Xmonad, you will have to install Haskell just in order to run Xmonad. And, you know, Haskell is kind of big. It is, it's, it's kind of a, a large package. Uh, I think it's several hundred megabytes, if I recall correctly. It's, it's quite a lot. And if you only ever use it for X, Xmonad, well, Xmonad is pretty lightweight, but Haskell isn't. So that's just something to keep in mind. But nowadays, you have so much storage on your devices, it's not much of a deal anyway. Uh, well, yeah, that's all I have to say about Xmonad. Uh, actually, yeah, there's one more thing I was going to show in the Arch wiki. There is an entry for Xmonad, and there is a, a specific like tutorial how to set up Xmobar to work with Xmonad. This is kind of the minimal thing you need to include in your Xmonad configuration in order for Xmobar to work. It's, it can be found on the Arch wiki. I trust you can find this yourself, right? So that's it for Exmo Annette. Any more questions? Nope, great. Then the next uh, tiling window manager I'm showing you is called i3. i3 is again uh, list based. Let me just close this terminal. Uh, it's uh, no, what am I saying? It's tree based. Of course, and here we don't have a binary tree, but instead we have any tree, just like in the example I showed you on the slides. So if I open some windows, you will notice they're all next to each other, they're all brothers. If you recall that little graphic I made on my slides, we just have one circle, the, the root node, and it contains many, 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 many tr children, which are all terminal windows. And usually this is not what you want. Usually when you want to have one window, there may be another, then you want to have the next, for example, below the right window. So you would go, okay, I want to split this vertically now. And now maybe you've noticed this, uh, this border line is now a bit brighter than the others. And this means that the next window is going to open in that direction. This is kind of similar to the BSP WM pre-selection with the yellow rectangle. You know, it's just a lot more subtle. So I open the next window and there it is below the last. And I can now open more windows and they're going to be opened in the same direction. But or I can like go and say, I want to split this one horizontally again. Uh, and then there we go, we split horizontally. So this is really uh, very similar to the example I showed you in the slides. I can, for example, split this one vertically and then this horizontally. Again, you can play around this. this you can create the most elaborate layout tree of the world if you want to. Uh, <coughs> So I trust you, I don't need to explain the tree layout again. I've already did that. Um, but there is something special about i3. Because, for example, if I take this container and uh, open some windows, uh, I've told you that an internal node in a layout tree can be either horizontally or vertically split. Now, in i3, that is still true. But there are two additional modes for the layout. They cannot be only horizontally or vertically split, but they can also be tapped or stacked. And there's what it looks like. I can now put this container into the tapped mode. And now all those three terminals that have previously been on top of each other are now kind of behind each other. Uh, it's similar to full screen mode, only just for this internal node. And then, you know, these look like browser tabs. I can now switch between those windows through those tabs. And stacking mode is pretty similar. Uh, whoops, here, uh, here, but here the tabs are on top of each other in, instead of next to each other. You might wonder why do we need this di distinction? Wouldn't tapping mode be enough? Why do we need stacking mode? Well, this comes in handy if you, for example, open uh, several more windows in a nested container. For example, now I have a vertical node within a window that is in stacking mode. I can now switch this to tabbing. And now you see uh, those are next to each other. So those are in a separate window and those are on top of each other. So those are kind of belong to a different node, different internal node. And if those were also in stacking mode, you kind of couldn't distinguish. So, you know, those four windows belong to the nested container, but this one doesn't. This one is in kind of, it's, it's the uncle of the other window and you kind of cannot distinguish. That's why we have this tabbing, whoops. That's why we have this tapping mode, so that we can still distinguish 
whether a window belongs to the inner or the outer of two nested containers. So, of course, you can say, oh, well, these tapping things are fancy, but they're not tiling because the windows cover up each other. And yeah, you're right, they're not tiling, but sometimes they're nice to have anyway, because, for example, when I'm browsing, I told you I usually have my browser in full screen, but, you know, I use Firefox, and Firefox has uh, private browsing mode. And sometimes I use private browsing mode. And then I have to open a separate Firefox window that is in private browsing mode. And, well, stan in standard, this would be open next to my currently active Firefox browser, and then I would have two instances of Firefox next to each other. But I only use one of them at a time. So what do I do? I put them in tapping mode. And then I only see one at a time, because I only need one at a time. I'm either in private browsing mode or I'm not, but not both. Uh, so uh, this is different from full screen mode, because now I can actually go and open another window next to my two Firefox instances. And you know, the two Firefox instances are still like grouped together and they tile together. Uh, so this is different from having everything full screen because when I have everything full screened, I cannot open windows next to everything. It doesn't make sense, right? So this is cool to have sometimes, but it can also get pretty confusing if you know, you know have uh, nested containers with more nested containers, which now can in be in one of four different layout modes, and it, it, things get really complicated. That's why I say it's important to know this three concept. But even though this is all true, i3 is still the one window manager that I do recommend for beginners. Now, why is that? Uh, i3 comes with useful defaults. So if you install i3, you will see it's quite uh, feature rich. It has the status bar included. And the configuration that ships with i3 default is already readily usable. Most other window managers need to be configured first because uh, you know the default key bindings are kind of awkward or they have to be actually patched like DWM. But i3 just comes usable out of the box. That's one big reason why I recommend it for beginners. The second is it is among those I'm showing you today, i3 is the best documented window manager. I'll show you that. This is the i3 website, and this is the i3 user's guide. And if you start using i3, I really recommend you give this a look, because, for example, here we have this nice picture with the default key bindings for i3. This is really nice to have, because when you start using tiling, you will need to remember quite a few key bindings at first. You need those. And unlike me, you only need to remember one set of key bindings for one specific window manager. And, you know, i3 was also the first window manager I used. And then I started and was like, hmm, which keys do I press again? So I always had this picture open in my browser somewhere. And if I forgot something, I just could look, look up. And it took me less than a day. And then I already remembered the most important key bindings. It's really not that hard. And this user guide does not only contain its key bindings, but it also kind of explains the tree concept. You will see uh, there's a nice graphic with a small layout tree. This is kind of the same thing that I already told you, so you already know this. You, so you already know it. You can skip this section. Great. All right. And then here, configuring i3. That's the next headline. Each and every tidbit that you can configure in the i3 configuration file is explained in great detail here. So this makes it pretty easy to look things up. You don't need to Google around for hours. You just have this user guide open, and then you search the user guide for what you need, and you will usually find it. And I will now show you the i3 configuration file. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, here, you see, this is not a programming language. This is a configuration language. And i3 will read this file and then understand what's going on. And here, for example, here I'm defining color schemes. Here. Uh, I'm, def I'm defining a key uh, binding, yeah, bind symbol, mod, mod again is my Windows key, shift and P, that would be my lock screen, and here I have screenshot key bindings, a uh, screen to change my wallpapers, because I like to change my wallpapers often. Uh, this is all defined in this file, and it's actually pretty easy to understand, while still being actually quite powerful. And here, uh, these are all the key bindings that move around my windows and bring me to other workspaces. And you know, this is this is basically almost plain English. The key symbol modifier plus shift plus five moves the current container to workspace five. Easy to understand, easy enough, right? 
So that is the next big reason why I recommend this for beginners. The configuration is quite straightforward to use. It comes with a default configuration file that's already useful, and usually you only need to make some minor modifications to it, and then you're off, you're ready to go, right? So that's why this is what I recommend, even though the tree layout is a bit more complex. I mean, you can still use i3 without the tapping and stacking mode. You don't need to use them. Nobody is forcing you to. So that will make it easier again. Then uh, i3 also has a tool similar to BSPC. It's called i3 message. And I can, like, for example, go uh, uh, workspace workspace 3 and then what it does is moves me to workspace 3 you can see it down here and you've noticed that workspace 3 hasn't been there previously i3 is again creating workspaces dynamically so if i go back to workspace 1 then workspace 3 is removed because it's empty and no longer visible uh, and you might now think this looks like xmonad but it's not like xmonad if i now switch to workspace 2 then the workspaces won't be swapped around but instead it just moves me to one or two Seen that? I was on Workspace yeah, 1, you see that this uh, little icon is filled out. Then I switched to Workspace 2, and now I'm here on Monitor 2. So this is different from Xmonad, right? Uh, if I create a new workspace, then i3 will, it place, it on, will place it on the monitor on the which I currently am. So now I'm on Monitor 2. Actually, let me open a terminal here. If I now open a new workspace, for example, workspace 3, it's going to be opened on monitor 2, because that's where I already am. And if I want to have workspace 3 on monitor 1, I actually need to first remove it again, then go to monitor 1, and then go to workspace 3 again. So now it's on monitor 1. Right? Everybody still following? Yeah? Yeah, you can, but it's not configured by default, so I'm not mentioning it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. But the thing is, you can you can make most window managers behave like other window managers. For example, I have written a bash script that uses i3 message for my own i3 uh, that makes i3 behave like xmonad when it comes to monitor and workspace swapping. So this is entirely possible. And it's not only possible in i3, but it's also possible in most others. But if I were to tell you everything that is possible in every window manager that you're seeing today, we would still be here tomorrow. So I'm kind of leaving that out. And yeah, Lucas is right, it's kind of unfair. But you know, I have to set my limits somewhere. I can't just go on forever about this. <laughs> so new workspaces are created on the currently active monitor. And once they are created, they again, this is the default configuration, they remain on the same monitor. If I now go to Workspace 2 and then back to Workspace 3, you know, Workspace 3 isn't currently visible, but you see it is on Monitor 1. So if I were to switch to Workspace 3, I'm also going to switch to Monitor 1, because that's where Workspace 3 is. So again, similar to BSPWM, Workspaces belong to monitors. Workspace 3 is on Monitor 1 and it's not going to move anywhere. But if Workspace 3 kind of dies, now it's gone, now it can, can be reopened on any monitor. That's the key difference to BSPWM here. And again, this is only the default behavior. It can be influenced. For example, i3 has a pretty easy uh, configuration construct that allows you to kind of specify that workspaces 1 to 4 should always be on monitor 1, regardless whether I open them from monitor 2 or monitor 1. And that would again make it uh, equal to BSPWM, how BSPWM handles it. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, i3 is the only window manager of those six I'm showing you today that knows command modes. If you use Vim, you will already know what a command mode is. This is basically, I have a specific key binding that changes my current command mode. For example, now I'm in resizing mode. And in resizing mode, actually, this doesn't make sense if I only have one window. Now I'm in resizing mode, and what happens now, if I now press my arrow keys, the windows are going to be resized. And this is not what my arrow keys normally do. Normally, my arrow keys just act as arrow keys. I can also uh, resize with H, J, K, and L. And you know, normally H, J, K, and L are supposed to type H, J, K, and L respectively. So in this command notes, all my keys, or actually only some of them, can do something different. 
and all the key bindings that I previously had are gone. They're no longer relevant. You know, I cannot switch switch workspace anymore in, in resize mode. I first had to get out of resize mode and now this works again. And this is also uh, seen in the configuration file all the way at the bottom. Here we see the resize mode is defined here and everything that's, that is within these uh, two curly brackets is only active in resize mode and all the rest is inactive in resize mode. So yeah, that's something nice to have. You can actually have more key bindings than you have keys by using these kinds of modes. And it's pretty neat, especially if you're already a Wim user and familiar to command modes, you can do a real l a lot with this. Yeah, so that's all I'm going to tell you about i3. Do you have questions? Sandro? Let me just to say, i3 status may not be included in i3. It's a dependency as far as I can tell. When I installed i3 on Arch Linux, it was a dependency. The only thing that, w that was not a dependency was the menu. Well, I don't have I3 status on my system. Well, I don't know. I do. <laughs> yeah, and you see, well, yeah? It's in the package group. Ah, I see, I see. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. So, um, yeah. Um, maybe I'm actually going to tell you this. I wanted to leave it out because we're kind of running late. This course is taking a bit longer than expected, so I'm going to give you a second break in a second. Yeah, the status bar is... I, I said it's feature, comp feature rich and it's included. It's not the whole truth. Actually, it is a separate program, but it kind of belongs to i3. It's called i3 status. It is in, in s usually it's a dependency of i3 and installed alongside, or on Arch Linux it's in the same pa package group which is nice, of course. And yeah, the default i3 configuration that, that you will install when you install i3, it is set up to use i3 status. But you can replace the status bar through any other. For example, pe many people use Conkey because Conkey uh, looks better, for example. So it can be swapped out. And what Sandra just said is that i3 status doesn't automatically come with i3 when you install it. Uh, it may be true in some distributions, uh, well, you, you will have to see, actually. And I think i3 is going to tell you when i3 status is missing. I, don't, I wouldn't know. Maybe Sandra does. Okay. There will be a red message saying that it was unable to execute the status. All right, great. Uh, yeah, so I promised you another break. It's going to be 10 minutes again, and then we'll see another two demos, and then we're done. So I expect this course to take another 30 minutes maximum. Is that all right with you? And if you need to leave now, of course you can. Uh, you don't need to stay here till the end. But it would be great because, yeah, I'm going to show you more window managers, and window managers are awesome. All right, uh, we have a break now, and see you later. Uh, yeah? Can you not just skip the break if it's possible? Sorry? Uh, can you not skip the break and continue to uh, Well, I could, of course. Uh, do you? Who wants to skip the break? Who wants? Who really wants to have the break? All right, well, then I will skip it, of course. <laughs> so, are there questions regarding i3 anymore? Yes? Can I my own modes, like the modes? Yes, you can. Okay. It's really straightforward. You just type mode and then you give your mode a name and then you type two, two curly brackets and everything you that define within these brackets is going to be in your, in your new mode. And then you will have to define an additional key binding that actually switches to your new mode. You're going to have to do that. But you can, you can set up your modes yourself. You can set up as many as you like. All right, let's get on with the next window manager. This one is called Awesome. It's again a list-based tiling window manager. And this one is the most feature-rich tiling window manager that we're seeing today. Uh, you can see it's list, whoops, wrong window manager, I'm sorry. It's list-based, so by default it comes with the master and stack lab. By the way, uh, this flickering when I open a new window, that is not a problem with Awesome. That is a problem with my demo setup with this additional screen here. It's kind of running a window manager within another window manager, and Awesome kind of doesn't like that, so that's why it flickers. So that's not a problem with Awesome itself, and you kind of have to ignore it. Uh, anyway... Awesome, I said it's the most feature-rich window manager we've seen today. 
the status bar is included and awesome is actually also the only window manager who includes uh, a launcher at least the only one I've seen tonight you know you know I usually just use the menu I didn't show it over and over again as it's always the same but in awesome you get the awesome launcher it doesn't really have a name you see this looks a bit prettier it actually does include the program icons and the official program names not only the cryptic commands names and I can now go and open Tunar and it actually does say file manager is kind of nice that's the main difference. Another great difference is to the other window managers is uh, Awesome has a lot more different layouts and I'll show you those now. Uh, here we have of course the ordinary master layout and I can of course um, uh, change the amount of master panels here so again this display glitch is not caused by my demo setup ignore it please and then I have master, master on the right side, master with master at the top, master with master at the bottom. Here I have grid mode and here it actually tries just to distribute my windows as evenly as possible on the screen. Uh, here this is horizontal grid and you can see that the remainder of the windows that doesn't fit the grid is just on, on top of each other here. Uh, we also have a vertical grid mode. Here the remainder of the windows is at the bottom next to each other. The windows are organized in rows. And here we have spiddle mode. Actually, let me put this aside so you can see better. This is spiral mode. Here we have dwindle mode. And this is now full screen mode. And then we have another full screen mode. This time it's really full screen. It even covers up the status bar. This is really full screen mode, and here we have what's called magnifying mode. This basically just means that the first window in the list is kind of uh, larger than the others and covers the rest up, and all the others are just visible behind. And now if I select one of the windows that are in the background, they're gonna be put to the foreground. So now the window with the this low, uh, this is a problem with my terminal by the way, uh, it's gonna be put to the foreground. Again, this uh, pixel glitch is not a problem with Awesome. <laughs> uh, I personally don't like magnifying mode, but if you think this is cool, I think it might be handy if you're using, uh, if you're having a lot of text files open and you're modifying them one after the other, for example. Uh, now, this is floating mode, doesn't look any different, but now I can like drag my windows around as I want. Again, I don't like floating mode. And now we're back at the uh, master in stack mode. Let me just close all this mess and start with some clean new terminals again. All right, so you see awesome has all of the layout modes, all of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, that's actually in many ways it's similar to DWM. It also uses text. You see that even those <coughs> icons look similar to DWM. I can tag one window to several uh, Actually, what I just did is I opened several tags. I can tag one window to several different tags. For example, this one is now on tag one. Uh, oops, sorry. It's now on tag one and on tag three. And on tag two it isn't. So this is like DWM again. Um, uh, this panel up here, I have told you this is integrated in Awesome. And you can modify what's shown in this terminal. Uh, by modifying the Awesome configuration. Now, Awesome is configured in Lua. And Lua is an interpreted uh, scripting language, and it's actually quite powerful. But it has a disadvantage, I've already told you. If you have a powerful configuration, then chances are it's gonna be confusing as heck. And that's exactly what the Awesome configuration is. Um, you see, uh, first we have some library imports that we need to use. We have a library that's called Awful, library that's called beautiful, one is called naughty, they kind of like their names, I guess. Um, then we have some actual function definitions that do something. And I have to say, I looked at this configuration and I was hella confused, because there are so many modules used, you kind of don't know what they're all doing. And, you know, as an exercise to myself, I tried to make this little tooltip here that displays a random code, much like my terminals always do. So every minute this code is gonna change, and I kind of did that in order to see whether I would be able to actually do that. That's the only reason, really. So what I did, I went to the configuration. I defined an array of text 
at widget text boxes and the text of those I set to awful.util.pread. This is a utility that runs a program and returns its output. The program that I'm running is Fortune minus SN60. The 60 means that basically I only want quotes that are shorter than 60 characters. And then I have a timer here that time, times out every 60 seconds. And every 60 seconds I run this my fortune set text thingy command again so that the, the code changes, you know. Uh, and I only did this to see whether I could. And then I found the awesome API documentation. This is pretty good, actually. If you want to modify awesome, you will love this. It's, it really uh, is a quite in-depth documentation of all the modules that awesome comes with. These are Lua modules that awesome uses in its configuration. There is, for example, a, a module called Beautiful that is specifically made for theming awesome, for changing the colors or the wallpapers. Uh, awesome does actually set the wallpaper by itself, all the others don't. So, yeah, this is pretty cool. If you want a window manager that you can turn into whatever you want, then it's gonna be awesome. But it also, uh, it takes some work to get this running, actually, because, yeah, it is quite advanced and it is quite complicated. Uh, but there's that. That's all I'm showing about Awesome. So, any questions about Awesome right now? Nope. Then, now we're already at the last, don't worry, we're almost done. <laughs> uh, this uh, is Carl, it's called Herbstloft WM. Let me put this to the side again. Herbstloft WM has a kind of different approach from all the others. It includes both tree and list based layouts, and both of them at the same time. Now you might wonder how does that work? They're so fundamentally different. How can you combine them? I'm going to show you in a second. But first off, we have our screen, which comes with this uh, green frame. This kind of indici indicates where the next window will go. And I can now go and uh, split this. Whoops. Now I have two of them. Then I can go to this and split it again and split this one again, maybe split this one again, and so on. And this is much like PSPWM. This has to be a binary tree. So uh, each internal node has exactly two children. Now, you might wonder, well, what is this even? Well, what would I do with these empty frames? Well, now I can open, for example, a terminal, and it will open the, it will occupy the currently active frame. I can go to this frame, open another terminal, and there it is. It's going to take up exactly this space. And if I close it again, then the frame that it has been in still persists. Now, well, why would anyone want this? This is additional work you need to do. You first need to make a frame, and then you need to open a program to go in that frame. This is additional work, why would you want this? Well, the cool thing here is that you can open multiple terminals in the same frame, and now these are again managed by a list-based layout. The list-based layout modes are a bit less advanced. For example, you don't have a master and stack mode, you just have vertical mode where they're all on top of each other, then you have horizontal mode where they're all next to each other, then you have full screen mode where you can cycle between them in the same frame, and then you have a grid mode where they're evenly distributed. That's all of them. So you don't get the fancy master and stack layout, but you don't really need them because you can already like make a new frame next to it and then it will, that, that will be kind of your master. So you can open several windows in the same frame. This is cool. And you can also have frames that contain no windows. Well, why would you want this? For example, if I have my screen all filled up with windows, let me just do that real quick, uh, everything is full and I now I want to kind of close this terminal but have a file manager open instead. So I want to kind of replace this window here through a file manager window. What I usually do is I first close the terminal and then the window manager realizes, okay, this terminal is gone, now I can reuse the space, so it would rearrange the layout so that it occupies its space again. Then I open my file manager, and then the, the, the window manager would again, oh, there's a new window, where do I place it? And then it would not necessarily go in the same place than the terminal was. It might go somewhere else, you don't know. It kind of depends on your current layout. And here, when I close the terminal, the space is still being reserved. And I can now go and open Tunar, and there it is, in the exact same place. So this is kind of awesome if you always have the same kind of layout, but you use different programs in it. And you can, of course, uh, close those individual frames. 
Uh, by the way, what happens if you close a frame that already includes something? Then that something, in this case the Berkeley terminal, will be pushed to that frame spreader. So now both terminals are in the same container and can be switched off. Yes. So that's that. And herbst.wm also has a program called herbst client. And this is like BSPC. It's pretty powerful and you can, like, for example, I can now go use in the index free that goes to a different uh, workspace that can go back again of course so I can do anything in herbs lift, uh, herbs client and herbs lift up with herbs client that means I could for example write a bash script that sets up those frames for me in a specific way that I want for example I want to have a, a two by two layout it sets that up for me and the advantage is I don't need to know what kind of windows I'm going to open in here. I don't need to know. I can just define the layout without the windows. And no other window manager can do this. And now I have my layout set up and I can fill this with any kinds of windows I want. I can put in my browser, my file manager, my terminals, whatever I want. I don't need to know in advance. And this is awesome if you use a lot of different programs but you want to have them in the same kind of layout. Then this comes in really handy because to you, you don't need to know which programs you're going to open. You first make the layout and then open the programs. So there's that. And another thing that Awesome has is another layout mode for its frames. They're called frames, those kind of borders. And that is pseudo tile mode. Now, this terminal is in pseudo tile mode. What happens? Well, it does no longer occupy the entire frame. And if I open a new frame here, then the terminal is still kind of not occupying the entire frame, but just, you know, you might wonder why is this useful? Uh, I know one pretty specific case where it is useful, and that would be for Java apps. You know, Java apps are sometimes picky with tile and window management because Java apps don't like to be resized. They're kind of, yeah, hey, window manager, I'm a new window. I'm, I'm going to have uh, 600 by 800 pixels in size. And then the window manager is yeah, like, yeah, bad luck for you. I'm a Thailand window manager, and I'll have you occupy exactly half of the screen. And then the Java applet is like, no, 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 I can't be resized. I'll never be resized. They won't do that. And then everything is fucked up, you know. And here in this pseudo tiling mode, the window manager only tells the window where to go, but it does not tell the window which size it's supposed to have. So the Java applet can have its 600 by 800 pixels as much as it wants, but it's still kind of integrated in the tiling layout. It's not floating. It's not. Uh, it's not kind of completely independent, independent of the layout. So this is nice to have. Yeah, you know, Java applets are one specific case where no, uh, this kind of problem often occurs. There are some other programs who have this uh, problem. So this is kind of nice to have. But of course, for terminals, it doesn't make sense. So yeah, one more thing. I haven't mentioned the workspaces yet. They behave like an XML node, so that's, that's basically all there's to it. If I switch to workspace 2, then the workspaces are interchanged. This is really like XML node. The only difference being that all the workspaces already exist from the beginning. Uh, the configuration is uh, really similar to Herbstluft, uh, to BSPWM, because this is just a bash script. And in this bash script, we call Herbst client really often. The only difference to BSPWM is that here, Herbst client actually does the key bindings uh, on its own. So there's not, nothing more that needs to be said about this. The status bar in uh, Herbst.wm is again a separate program. This is not included. In this case, I'm using dsend2. And now this is really, we've already seen this. This is a bash script where I first define where my status bar would go, and then I'm calling a, a command that's herbst client tag status, and then I have to specify which monitor I'm on. Uh, for example, herbst client tag status for this zeroth monitor, and then I get this kind of output. Okay, first I have a workspace that is visible and occupied, then I have a workspace that is currently active, and then all the others are not visible and empty. This is kind of similar to BSPWM, except it's more legible. Uh, so, yeah, really, we've already seen all of this. Uh, there's not much more to it. I have the script that parses the output. Well, if it's a hash, then we're going to have an active monitor. It's going to have those colors and so on and so forth. We've already seen this. I don't think I need to tell you any more about this. So, yeah, you see, Herbstluft WM has a really easy and straightforward configuration, just like BSPWM does. 
it kind of has the multi-monitor behavior that Xmonad has, and it it also oops it manages these windows in a binary tree. Except that you don't get windows, you get those frames that contain any amount of windows, even none. So that's all regarding Herbstluft WM. Do you have any questions? All right. So now we're finally done with the uh, right one question. I myself I use i3 because I really prefer the tree-based layout over the list-based, and I also couldn't like get along with the binary trees. They're just too limited for me. I like to place my windows wherever I want. For that reason, I still use i3, even though, well, my window manager of dreams would have the layouting of i3 and the multi-monitor behavior of xmonad and the tag system of awesome and dwm and the ability to have those preoccupied frames that Tarps Luft WM has, you know. But you can have everything, you have to decide somewhere. And I thought that the layout thing would be the most important, so I picked i3. Right? Uh, so, sorry, you were asking what kind of functions there are? Or? Uh, yeah, there are key <coughs> bindings to move around windows, like in any other window manager. I can just grab this window and move it to other frames. I can also move it within a single frame in the list. Um, for example, if I go here now and open another frame, I can like uh, take this window, move it up and down between those frames. I can also move them inside frames that already contain something. This is quite straightforward, actually. Uh, I think there is, but I have to say I don't remember which one it was. Yes, that's, that's true. It's true. In i3 you can resize the windows by dragging <coughs> the line between them and the mouse. Uh, there was one window manager where you could rearrange your windows with the mouse, but I have to say I don't remember which one it was. Uh, I, I suggest you come to me after the course and then we're going to test each of them, alright? So, yeah. Any more questions about Herbstluft WM? All right. So, yeah. Um, actually, I, I would show you some more screenshots uh, that are from, from Reddit, Reddit subreddit Unix porn, because the window managers that I've showed you, they kind of look, uh, well, pretty bland. And you might now say that, well, it's, they're not pretty, they're not fancy, I don't like that, I want my window manager to look cool. And you can actually do that. I'm only going to briefly show you the screenshots. This is Xponad, configured to have those nice gaps around the windows, which look pretty nice, and there's a fitting color scheme over everything, which really adds to it. So, well, window managers looking ugly is not an excuse, because, well, they might look ugly out of the box, but you can configure them to look really awesome. This here is uh, Herbstluft WM. And here, the guy who uses it has disabled those uh, grayish empty frame borders. They're just disabled because they thought they look ugly. Oh, I have to say, he's actually right. This looks a lot better. <laughs> uh, here, this is i3 with a custom status bar at the bottom, at the top. You see that? And here, the last one. This is BSPWM. Actually, quite like this theme because it's it's pretty minimal. It's only colors and frames, right? Right and yeah, so I have to say, uh, window managers looking ugly is not an excuse. So what now? We're finally at the end. I'm going to make a short Q&A round. If you still want, still want to be with me, you can come to the desk, and then you can actually try the window managers yourself. You can ask uh, more questions. If you like the alternative, you can come to our next Stammtisch, which is on Thursday. The date and place are also on our website. Then I've promised you that you could use my configuration files. They can be found on our website. They're not uploaded yet, but they're gonna be soon. Uh, so I promise you, you can find all my configurations and the slides uh, under this link soon. So yeah, we're finally done. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bearing with me up to the end. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> Have a nice evening.